E3 of 2006 is when we got our first glimpse of Final Fantasy Vs. 13, a game that would require 10 years of rocky development and a rebranding before finally being made available to the public as Final Fantasy 15. It's important to note that development for the official build that players got their hands on has only spanned about 4 years, but for those who have been anticipating the game since a first glance 10 years prior, Final Fantasy 15 has some big shoes to fill. Well, the game is out, the reviews are in, and if they're anything to go by, the game has actually been pretty positively received. Which I take issue with. You see, I don't think people truly realize how important Final Fantasy XV is not only to its own series, but to the future of the genre. And because of that importance, I felt compelled to make this very video. After all, if this is supposed to be the future of the JRPG genre, it needs to be treated and judged as such, and not just blindly praised. In case you couldn't tell by the incredibly long runtime of this video, it goes into a lot of detail. This video contains spoilers for Final Fantasy XV, Brotherhood, and Kingsglaive. It also contains spoilers for every game that Hajima Tabata has ever been the director of. I highly suggest that you finish playing Final Fantasy XV before watching this video, both so things won't be spoiled for you, but also so you can have some personal perspective before hearing my opinion. So let's buckle up for a journey of our own to examine every facet of Final Fantasy XV. I feel the best place to start with this video is to ask a very simple question. Is Final Fantasy XV a good Final Fantasy game? It seems like it'd be simple enough to answer, right? I thought so too at first, but after spending a lot of time thinking on it, talking to other people online, and reading a lot of forums, it actually turned out to be a lot more debatable than I'd previously thought. I should be clear that this is not a question of quality, but of whether or not it holds up to the same ideals and concepts as the previous entries. The problem is, it seems that the majority of Final Fantasy fans can't even agree upon what elements make up a Final Fantasy game. Some say it's a turn-based combat, some say memorable characters and stories, some say it's just the beautiful graphics and music, but there doesn't seem to be a unified consensus, and the fans don't seem to be the only ones with that problem. The father of Final Fantasy himself, Hironobu Sakaguchi, once jokingly stated that to qualify as a Final Fantasy game, a title must have, and I quote, a blue window with text in it. This definition alone is an interesting one, as it includes the often cited train wreck that is Final Fantasy XIII, and yet doesn't include the fan-adored Final Fantasies VIII and IX, at least based upon their default settings, that is. Now obviously this is a ridiculous standard in the first place, given that by this definition not only would we have contradictions within the game's own series, but it would also mean that all of these games are also Final Fantasy games. Even so, that incredibly vague standard of what makes a Final Fantasy game is rather apt, given that Final Fantasy XV is now out and has about as much in common with its own series as all the other titles that I just momentarily flashed on screen. If all you expect from a Final Fantasy game is a story at least vaguely centered around crystals, then yes, Final Fantasy XV does indeed fit in with the rest of the entries of the series. But if you're looking for a deeper connection, elements that match between XV and previous entries, then you're not likely to find them here. If you're looking for at least somewhat decent self-contained story, then you're going to walk away feeling like you got ripped off. And most importantly, if you remember a time when Final Fantasy was at the forefront of its genre, instead of chasing after trends and holding on to false hopes, then you're going to walk away disappointed. Let's get all the skin deep elements out of the way. Yes, this game has chocobos. Yes, this game has a character named Sid. Yes, this game has magic. Actually, the game kind of doesn't have magic. Unless you count throwing grenades as magic. But it, but it does have summons. See, Square's got you covered. 
So I really have to point out how shallow your way of thinking is if you think that this is all that Final Fantasy is about. I mean, come on. Breaking Bad isn't great because it shows the slippery slope of a man in distress and how loose morality becomes when your life and by extension the life of your family is on the line. It's special because it's a TV show that openly talks about selling drugs. I feel I've made my point. You're goddamn right. So, what does that mean for Final Fantasy? What are the defining elements of the series? At one point, that was actually an incredibly easy question to answer. You see, Final Fantasy was Final Fantasy because there were two particular visionaries running the show, constantly crafting the charm and heart that made the series what it is. Or at least, what it used to be. The heart and soul of Final Fantasy came from the creative combination of Hironobu Sakaguchi and Nobu Uematsu, with some Tetsuya Nomura sprinkled in in a few places, because his talents can be put to good use as long as someone else is around to rein him in. Now I know someone is going to mention the fact that Sakaguchi hasn't been the head director of Final Fantasy since number 5, but from the research I've done, despite his title changing, he still remained hands on for all the following titles as well, at least through to Final Fantasy X. Yoshinori Kitase is also an arguable addition to this dream team, as he took the prolific role of director in some of the most recognized RPGs Square has ever produced. Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy VII, and Chrono Trigger to be more specific. I don't know what the hell happened to his talents. Perhaps being bumped to a supervisor and producer means he can't be hands on with the projects anymore, and maybe that's part of why the main games are so lackluster now, but I, I, I don't really know, I'm not there. Anyway, the point is, around 2004, the two stars of the series both left the company to pursue their own interests. Uematsu left to work in his company Smile, Please before continuing with Dog Ear Records, while Sakaguchi went to form the game development studio Mistwalker. As interesting as all the drama surrounding the Square and Enix merger is, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Besides, it's not really important to know why Sakaguchi and Uematsu left, just the fact that they did leave. Though, I will point out that if you're interested in seeing the video on that in the future, that's what the comments are for. Anyway, as much as I do truly believe that the magic left the series when those two artists did, this thesis hinges on the belief that a piece of art cannot continue to be such without the original creators, which I admit is highly debatable. After all, TV and movie series switch directorial hands all the time and we don't often consider them any less real than the initial ones. I feel the primary difference here comes down to circumstance. You see, when something like the Harry Potter movie series switches directorial hands, there is still a unified story that is taking place, something tying them all together despite different artists being at the helm of the movie adaptations. This does get muddled even more when we bring up the fact that the main story was all still written by one artist anyway, but I hope you can see where I'm going with this. The problem with Final Fantasy in this regard is that it's defining characteristic. The only thing truly tying all of these games together is the unified vision of the two key people that made it, Sakaguchi who created the ideas, and Uematsu who sounds Soundtracks made the games come to life. Now, for people that know me, you're probably wondering if that's the case, then why do I think Final Fantasy XII worked? Well, frankly, the story didn't, and that is normally where the new team ends up failing, as we will see when I get to Final Fantasy XV's horrendous plot. But Final Fantasy XII did nail the gameplay and world design, which I think mostly comes down to the fact that a lot of the world and lore had already been conceptually designed years before, thanks to Final Fantasy Tactics and Vagrant Story. But once Final Fantasy XIII came around, well, things changed forever. So, since the two key players have been removed from the game, the definition of what makes Final Fantasy what it is also has to shift, and I truly believe that the developers themselves are floundering with this question as much as the fans are, especially if the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy and Final Fantasy XV are any indication. That's not even mentioning the abysmal launch of the original version of Final Fantasy XIV. Without the key members, there's nothing to set Final Fantasy apart from every other RPG series, so instead of looking for the defining feature, I'm going to change my sights and look internally. That way I can try and determine everything that the games have in common. I had to think on this for hours, coming through every game to see what core elements each of these games shared. I was able to think of a lot of things from the first 10 games, but as soon as I threw in the post Sakaguchi era, I was stumped. I could think of exactly three things that Final Fantasy has always strived for. Top of the line presentation, unique worlds to explore, and entertaining group based combat. Final Fantasy XV does make a good impression on the first topic, as it's a beautiful game. While I was initially skeptical about the mixing of a somewhat modern setting with the usual Final Fantasy aesthetic, I was amazed to see how well it all fit together. The game contains some absolutely gorgeous landscapes and the towns feel lively and realistic. At least as much can be expected from a world with such a mishmash of elements thrown in. The character design for the main heroes and villains is questionable because of how it clashes with the world, but it's not appalling or ugly looking. And while the game still drops frames here and there, it's nothing compared to the sorry state that Episode Death Sky was left in. Overall, I was quite impressed by the visual design of the game, and the sound design is equally satisfying. The voice actors did an excellent job playing their roles and sound effects were properly utilized. 
In my Final Fantasy XV predictions video, I voiced my concern about the music, that I wasn't sure Yoko Shimomura had what it took to compose an open world game like this all on her own. I made this statement and followed it up by saying I used to be a big fan of her work, but after having played pretty much every game she's ever made music for, I felt her talent was plateauing and that her music was far too repetitive for this type of game. I was half correct. I say this because Square decided to fill most of the game with silence, presumably because they too were worried that players would grow tired of the game's soundtrack if they had to listen to the same songs ad nauseum. After initially completing the game, I really didn't have an opinion on the soundtrack, mostly because I felt it got so little use and it was hard to judge, but after listening to the soundtrack outside of the game, I have to admit that I was actually quite impressed by not only how beautiful it was, but how varied it was. So you know what, Yokoshima Moore, you might have actually won back at fan today. The Stand By Me cover on the other hand, I absolutely detest. It felt so unbelievably forced and cheesy that I was embarrassed to listen to it with other people in the room. For the record, this is coming from a guy who spent 10 years performing in musical theater. I love cheesiness, but this song just rubbed me the wrong way. The vocals feel forced and they clash with what is supposed to be subtle instrumentation. It doesn't help that the singer's vibrato makes her sound like a yodeling goat. Beyond that, it reflects the wrong story themes. It's primarily a love song now being reused to present brotherhood, and then people wonder why the bromance in the game is such an easy target for inappropriate jokes. Speaking of which, Square, you cannot look me in the eye and act as if the implied homosexuality was an accident. And there's nothing wrong with that either. I just wish you'd have the guts to go through with it fully instead of scampering around the issue like frightened mice. I guess it explains why Cindy is almost nude. You have to compensate somehow, right? Anyway, I'm sorry about that tangent there, I just can't take the song seriously. It throws the game's credibility completely out the window by clashing with a theme and just... I don't know what to say, it was a mistake. Remember when Square used to write their own chart typing songs for their games? You know, Eyes On Me, Melodies of Life, Sateki De Ni, Kiss Me Goodbye... What happened to that? Oh, right, Uematsu left. Anyway, despite some personal grievances, Final Fantasy XV clearly succeeds at keeping up the series standards by having top of the line presentation. So far, so good. But does it have an interesting world to explore? Eh, I'm more on the fence with this one. I already admitted that the game has some breathtaking locales and the dungeon design is at least slightly better than what we had in the last game. You could argue that the world is fun to explore, it certainly has a scope and scale that few other games in the series have been able to match, though at times it feels less like a fantasy adventure and more like a spelunking simulator. It doesn't help that the game is mostly a large open environment that feels like landmarks are just sporadically placed. Not to mention that the open world design is used more as a hub for side quests than as its own unique and fully realized world. I'll give it a pass because I like elements of it, and I could see why other players would also enjoy it, though I found it to be a bit average in any regard beyond visual flair. And finally, we have the group based combat. Let's set aside the fact that this game's combat has about as much depth as a puddle and discuss the most appalling issue with the game's combat first. This is where many of you likely expect me to go on a rant about how Final Fantasy is no longer turn-based. And while, yes I am part of the old guard and I do wish it had stayed that way, that's not actually my main problem with the combat. See the one thing that really infuriates me, that they really screwed up on with Final Fantasy XV's combat, 
is that they took out the party dynamics completely. Every single game in the series from the original Nintendo outing to A Realm Reborn has made use of party strategy. Even Final Fantasy XIII, which a lot of players criticize the combat of, understood the importance of party dynamics to the core experience. So the fact that Square left it out here is absolutely baffling. For those who don't know what I mean when I say party dynamics, I mean the use of teamwork and complementary skills from all party members to make a stronger cohesive unit. Most RPGs implement this by going for the tank, healer, and damage per second roles, but I've seen this mold experimented within a lot of games with mixed levels of success. Final Fantasy XV lacks this completely. There's absolutely no purpose to you having teammates besides the story demanding it. This realization is made even more laughable when you realize how poorly the AI is programmed for said teammates, given that literally the only commands that they are given are attack enemy and revive fallen ally. Final Fantasy XV gives you no control over anyone except for Noctis, unless of course you count being able to tell them to retreat when they're being idiots. Now I know someone's gonna come along and point out the party attacks that the characters can do and those aren't party dynamics, okay? Those are this game's version of limit breaks. And isn't that just a little bit sad when you think about it? Now this, this is a limit break. This is a pathetic attempt at making you think that your teammates matter. Now I'm not gonna try and pretend that every Final Fantasy game was designed intelligently enough to require a lot of planning or strategy, but at least the rest of the games tried. Hell, even Kingdom Hearts, a game that this one's most often compared to, understood that party rules are important. It gave you Donald as a mage and Goofy as a tank. Sure, their AI was pretty horrendous, but they had skill sets that actually made them uniquely useful. And on top of that, the game gave you at least some level of customization that you could use to try and make them perform more efficiently. And this brings us around to why I'm always so baffled when I hear people denounce turn-based gameplay. Very few genres allow for the controlling of multiple characters at once, and even fewer do it well. We have RTS games, squad-based shooters, and some action games allow us to set only the vaguest of AI settings in the hope that our teammates will do something ridiculously stupid. So many people try and say that turn-based gaming, especially old-school RPGs, only exists because of the lack of technology at the time. And while there is some truth in the fact that technological limitations force developers to use this template at first, that isn't the reason the game stayed that way. I mean, obviously RPGs on the Super Nintendo were only turn-based because it couldn't handle real-time combat. No games ever allowed for real-time RPG combat on that system. And don't even get me started on the PlayStation 2, that underpowered piece of trash. It had so many turn-based games, clearly because I couldn't handle any real-time combat ones. The entire point of turn-based RPG combat was, and still is, to give the player complete control of a well-trained team of combatants, making use of characters' strengths and weaknesses to reinforce the mentality that the group is always stronger than a singular being. Hell, that's the plot of most of these older games as well, and still remains a popular theme in JRPGs as a whole today. Now let's assume even after I pointed that out that there's still some of you out there angrily stomping your feet, insisting that turn-based combat is stupid because that's not how things happen in real life. Apparently, you've never heard of symbolism or thought about the fact that sometimes concessions have to be made to make structurally sound mechanics. For example, you may not have realized this, but in real life you don't roll a dice to determine how many spaces you can move, or push X to interact with objects around you. It's a technique called abstraction which has been used since the dawn of gaming, whether in video or tabletop format. If we're going to complain about this, we should also complain about the existence of life bars regenerating health. Anyway, the point of that section, as I stated before, wasn't to say that turn-based gameplay is necessarily superior, just to show the benefits of it. That having been said, even if developers insisted on supposedly moving the series forward by leaning on action combat, they could have still done so while retaining the party dynamics. How do I know this, you ask? Because the Tales series has been doing it since 1995. If that isn't enough, Square owns Triace, the company who creates the Star Ocean games. Both of these series have been rather hit and miss with mixing traditional RPG gameplay with real-time combat and party dynamics, but both series have accomplished it splendidly more than once. So the fact that Final Fantasy, the one Japanese RPG series with more funding and resources than any other, couldn't find a way to make this work is pretty f***ing pathetic. Now I want to sincerely state that I'm not making fun of people who don't enjoy turn-based games. Some game types just aren't for some people, and that's perfectly fine. But try looking at it from the perspective of longtime series fans. Final Fantasy XV's extreme change in combat priorities is the equivalent of playing a mainline Call of Duty game without guns, or making StarCraft into a spectacle fighter like Bayonetta. A lot of hardcore fans would be immediately insulted if such a drastic change occurred in their favorite series. And for the few that are open-minded enough to give these games a try, the majority of them would still be upset if it was a next canon mainline entry that you'd been waiting years for. 
I, I mean, come on, guys. I can't be the only one looking forward to Uncharted 5. You know, Drake's retirement? The game where all you do is live his day-to-day -day life in the same style as the beginning of Heavy Rain? Alright, some of you may think that these examples are too hyperbolic, and they certainly are exaggerated for comedic effect, but let me give one final example that is not only perfectly analogous, but in the same genre. Final Fantasy without party dynamics is like Pokemon without elemental weaknesses. The combat would still mechanically function the same way, but it completely ruins the point of the game's combat by removing the key component that created for all of the strategy and depth. At that point, Pokemon would be about finding the creature with the biggest numbers next to its stat and spamming that one's attacks over and over again. Which is exactly how Final Fantasy XV plays, and yet it's being praised for it! My point is... Once you make too many changes to an entry in a long-running series, it becomes completely separated from the series that it claims to be a part of. And I feel a bit distraught that I have to remind people of this, but Final Fantasy is a video game. So when you make too many changes to the gameplay, you have nothing tying the game to the series it claims to be a part of. So in case I hadn't made it clear enough, no. Final Fantasy XV isn't a good Final Fantasy game no matter which angle it's viewed from. If I take my original stance where the only connective tissue is the artist who created it, then it's no longer Final Fantasy. If I attempt to broaden my definition, and given how loosely tied together the games in the series already are, this is an extremely large broadening, it still fails because it doesn't even understand the key ingredient to the series' gameplay. So if Square insists on changing things so much, why don't they just drop the Final Fantasy brand and make a new series? Why marketing, of course? 